people forget there's kind of like this triad where it's like you have a thought and then you have a feeling and then you have a behavior and it happens so quickly though that it's so automatic that we don't even sometimes recognize the thought or the feeling Welcome to the Tapping Q&A podcast recorded live to tape from Williamsburg in Brooklyn. This is episode 286, originally aired September 27th, 2017. Hi, everyone. I hope this finds you well wherever you are and whatever time of day you get a chance to listen to this. Thanks for spending some time with me today. In today's podcast, we have a great conversation about self-medicating behaviors. How do we identify them? Because some of them are a little unexpected and how you can start tapping for those behaviors right away and create some transformation in your life. Before we jump into that, just a couple of things at the top of the show. First of all, September 30th, um, which is a couple of days from when this podcast goes live, is International Podcast Day. The Tapping Q&A podcast has been around for a little more than eight and a half years. Um, We're closing in on 350 episodes between full episodes and bonus episodes and tap-alongs and instructions. On the 30th, if there is someone in your life who doesn't know how to podcast, do me a favor. Teach them how to podcast, even if you're not teaching them to download this particular podcast. You're listening to this, and you're doing it because it's made a difference in your life. I love podcasts. They have transformed my life. It's one of the ways I get a lot of information, the way I get entertainment. Because I do a podcast, some of my best friends in the world have come from interviews that I've done. It's an amazing way for us to connect with people all over the world. I listen to podcasts that are recorded on the other side of the world. People on the other side of the world listen to me. And it's just in a time when it's hard for us to sometimes connect, and we even talk about that a little bit in this episode, podcasts are a powerful tool. So find someone in your life who doesn't necessarily technologically know how to do this yet. Take a few moments, show them how to podcast. It will make a huge difference. The other thing that I wanted to share with you is a reminder that in November, I am participating in the Uncomplicate Your Money conference. It's two days of tapping and instruction. It's built for folks who are professionals in the healing world. Um, There are even CEUs, 12 CEUs available for those of you who need to do continuing education every single year. You can find out all of the details. We would love to see you in Orlando in November. All you need to do is go to tappingqna.com slash money. That's tappingqna.com slash money. Or if you go into the show notes, you will see a link right there. So if you're listening to this on your smartphone or your tablet, go into the place where there are all the words that describe this episode. Right at the top, you'll see a link to that event. We would love to see you there. If you have questions about the event, drop me a note, gene at tappingqna.com, and I will get you hooked up with any information you need. Today on the show, I have a conversation with Manal Khalif. This is Manal's actual third appearance on the podcast. Um, Before having her on the podcast, I didn't know her at all, and I have just adore her so much, and I love what she has to say in this particular conversation. The conversation is about self-medicating behaviors, and As you'll hear in this conversation, there are a whole host of self-medicating behaviors. It's really obvious when we think of things like food and alcohol and and stuff like that. But we do a much deeper dive of the places where self-medicating behavior shows up and how we can respond to it. And so it's a super constructive interview because it's going to give you some background information on what the problem is. It's going to help you to identify when the problem is showing up for yourself and others. And then finally, it's going to give you some really practical tips and tools on how you can respond or how you can reach out to get the help that you need to respond in your own life. Now, you will note the audio for Manal isn't exactly perfect in this interview, but the conversation was so good, it's totally worthwhile. I spent a little extra time in the editor cleaning it up so you can hear it nice and clearly. I know you're going to love the interview. Here is my conversation with Manal. What originally got you interested in thinking about addiction? Um, So when, so a few years ago, there was a friend of mine um, and she was going through her struggles with addiction and she had lost her kids at the time. And, you know, it was just kind of like, okay, well, where is she, you know, trying to figure out, you know, how we can help her. And 
So there was a lot of, you know, worry and, you know, just, just confusion kind of, because when she would come out of treatment, you know, we just saw her blossom and we saw her, you know, just, you know, this excited woman, you know, like she was excited about life and she was exercising and she was doing all these things. And then something would happen, um, you know, behind the scenes and she would be gone again. And sometimes, you know, she would just take off, literally say that she's going to fill gas or something in the car and just, we wouldn't see her again for weeks. Um, and so after I got divorced, I was like, you know, I, I want to go back to school. I had been out of school for a long time. And so I decided to, to go back and to go into counseling. And that was an area that I found really interesting. So I started, I went back to school to, to study it formally. There, there are lots of people who use the term addiction all of the time and they throw around all sorts of different things. Um, when you're using the term addiction, what do you actually mean by that? So, um, what I've noticed is that some people get, you know, kind of almost offended, you know, when you call something else an addiction, you know, shopping or, um, or eating or, you know, things like that. Um, but the way that I use it is really to talk about behaviors where, you know, you're coming back to a behavior again and again, and it's negatively impacting your life in one or more areas. Um, and so I do use it loosely and, um, and it's not to take away from, you know, drug addiction and alcohol addiction because, or even gambling, you know, because those are really serious and they do, you know, create changes in the brain and all of that. But I just wanted to, you know, bring to people's attention that those aren't the only addictions and that there are ways that we are escaping, um, you know, whether it's through food or whether it's through unhealthy relationships or shopping or, you know, there's different behaviors. And if it, it's not negatively impacting your life, then, you know, no big deal, right? You know, you're, you're going through life and it's fine, but if it is, then it's, it's time to, you know, take a look at that, you know, and kind of figure out where is it coming from? What is it you're escaping? You know, what is it you're escaping from? Um, you know, what emotions need to be processed, what traumas need to be processed. Oftentimes when we think of the impacts of addiction, we're thinking in terms of the, the specific things that we're doing. I'm doing drugs, I'm drinking lots of alcohol, I'm eating way too much food. And there's some specific consequences for that. Beyond those specific consequences of doing those actions, what are some of the other negative consequences for getting caught in some sort of self-medicating or addictive behavior? So what I find is that a lot of people will start to isolate themselves. Um, they'll start to get into unhealthy relationships, you know, maybe bouncing from one relationship to the other, getting, you know, finding themselves in situations where um, they're not setting up boundaries. They're, you know, they're being used and abused and, you know, they're not able to step up, you know, stand up for themselves. Um, a lack of self-confidence. Um, sometimes it affects work. Right. In the sense that, you know, people are missing work or, um, you know, calling in sick or, um, you know, coming in late or, you know, not finishing, you know, not finishing their work or not being as productive as they could be or as, as they should be. Um, you know, arguments and things with their family, just just an unhappy, you know, overall that there's this just kind of unhappy vibe in their life. Um, you know, and then of course there's depression and anxiety and all of those emotional things that are, that are happening also. Um, there are circumstances where we make bad choices simply because we're exhausted. You know, when I'm tired, when I'm hungry, I'm going to make a bad choice. So when someone is dealing with addiction and, or dealing with some sort of emotionally medicating behavior, it's because they're just in a really poor resource state and therefore all of those consequences you just listed could be a consequence of that. Is it just because it's so hard that's why they're having these other problems or is there something specific about what's going on that creates a situation like this that also compounds it with all of these extra bad outcomes? So sometimes people come into addiction because they're facing a particularly stressful time in their in their current situation or their current life. Um, other times, you know, especially with younger, you know, younger teens, um, young adults, you know, they're experimenting. So it starts out that way. Um, and, and for other people, you know, they've been doing it for such a long time in other ways. And now they just kind of have found a substance to that kind of gets them there faster, that kind of helps them escape faster or numb the pain or or escape in some way. Um, and I, you know, and I think that a lot of people, they, 
aren't as committed to self-care as they could be. Um, and yeah, so when it gets stressful, I mean, it's easy to turn to the very first thing or the, the fastest thing that'll get you into a state where you can forget your stresses, forget your day. You know, a lot of people, you know, they're drinking after work or, you know, you know, they're, they're, they're numbing it or they're escaping it in some way. And they know that they can go back to that. They know that that's an easy way. It's, it's a simpler way. It's, it's easier than going to therapy. It's easier than, you know, hiring a coach. It's easier than, um, you know, trying to make changes in your life, which is very difficult, you know, and it's very difficult even for people who aren't struggling with addiction. Um, and for people who are, you know, it is really hard to get motivated because it's like, you know, this thing is working for me. Um, and I, you know, I can just go back to it and I know I'll get the same outcome each time, you know? And I think what's really interesting in what you said there is you actually use the phrase, this is what is working for me. And this is easier than those other things. Oftentimes, I think from the outside, it's really easy for us to look at someone making these choices and just be really judgmental. You're making really bad choices. Um, but from the inside out, and this isn't necessarily in the clearest, most conscious way, when people are making these choices, they're making functional choices. If I do this thing, it changes my state. It changes my emotion. It changes how I feel physically. It makes me forget the things that are really, really difficult. And so it becomes a solution. From the outside, we can see it's a bad solution, and they maybe even intellectually see it not as a good solution over the long term, but emotionally it becomes this response where it's something that is super, super functional. Right. And the thing is, too, is that people forget that there's, you know, there's kind of like this um, triad where it's like you have a thought, and then you have a feeling, and then you have a behavior. Mm -hmm. And it happens so quickly, though, that... It, it's, you know, it's so automatic that we don't even sometimes recognize the thought or the feeling. So, you know, when we start learning how to drive, you know, in the beginning, it's very, I need to focus on, you know, what I'm doing and, you know, look at the mirrors and, and everything is just very, you know, you're focused on every single detail because you want to get it right. But then after a while, you know, after a couple of years of driving, you know, you end up at home and you don't even remember the drive there because it's just become so automatic. And so that's sort of what's happening, right? It's like, they may not be noticing or we may not be noticing that there's, you know, some kind of, you know, perhaps negative thought or, you know, a traumatic memory that, you know, you were triggered by, um, which triggers a feeling. And then that feeling then translates into a behavior. And in this case, you know, it's, it's drinking, you know, doing drugs, shopping, eating, whatever it is. Um, we just notice, oh, and even, you know, sometimes don't even, people don't even notice that I feel bad and then I eat. Or I feel bad and then I drink or I'm stressed at work. I need a drink, you know, and, and it's like almost we missed that that section in the middle where where there's the thoughts and feelings happening. We just notice the behavior and that's what outsiders are seeing, you know, and that and, and there is a lot of judgment because we'll look at them and go, oh, well, they can make a different choice. And it's like what happens so fast that they're not sitting there going, you know, oh, I'm going to do X, Y and Z and I'm going to you know ruin my life. Um, or ruin my relationship through this behavior. It's just really happening so quickly in their mind. And so, you know, as a counselor, our job is really to help them slow down that process so we can figure out what are the thoughts that are triggering, triggering it? What are the feelings that are triggering the behavior? And what you, you said in there is, is, I think, key, not just for the conversation that we're having today, but all the time in the work that we do, is to recognize that there is a thought that precedes all of the emotional responses that we have. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, we're going to be more successful in kind of reframing and tapping for something, not if we're able to identify the emotion, but if we're able to identify the thought that's before it, that gives us the opportunity to evaluate whether or not it's true and that becomes one of the entry points in being able to do this work right and i think too you know something that i learned in uh, you know in chemical dependency counseling is you know to meet your client where they are and you know it's been drilled in our head over and over and over and it's important in tapping as well because sometimes you know, the person doesn't know what the thought is, you know, I'll try different things and different techniques to, you know, try to dig and figure out what it is. But instead of doing that, I can just ask them, what do you know? What are you aware of? And for them, it might be the thought for them, it might be the feeling for them, it might be the behavior, they might go, I have no idea why I do this. But, you know, every night I'm, I'm binging or, you know, I, um, you know, I don't know what I'm thinking. All I know is I have this, you know, constriction in my breathing. You know, so I, I work with whatever they present to me and then we can, you know, 
kind of figure out the thoughts, the feelings and the behaviors, but really whatever they're presenting, whatever they're aware of is the perfect place to start. Yeah. And I, and I think it's useful for you to, to note that, that we start where they are and then this behavior came after a feeling, this feeling came after a thought, regardless of where we enter in. It now gives us a roadmap where we can start working backwards and we can enter in wherever we can enter in. But now we're on the right road that gives us the opportunity to work our way to that core. Right. And I think a lot of times, like for a lot of practitioners, we've had this experience where, you know, we're working on some, you know, on uh, working with someone on a particular issue. And all of a sudden, a memory that just seems completely unrelated shows up and they go, um, you know, I don't know why this is coming up, but, you know, I have this memory from when I was in third grade and I made fun of this kid in class, you know, and it seems completely unrelated, but we follow it. We go with it because it's showing up for a reason. And, you know, I really love that part of our work is that, you know, once the person is in a safe space, you know, working with a practitioner, they feel safe with, um, you know, more memories come up because sometimes a client will come and say, well, I want to work on this, you know, this particular trauma or this particular memory. But the subconscious mind will provide what it needs, you know, in order to let it go once it feels safe to do so. My single favorite phrase a client will ever use is this probably has nothing to do with it. But yeah. <laughs> like when yeah. we when we land in that spot, we know we're heading in the right direction. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So one of the things that you alluded to at the beginning, as we kind of talk about maybe more in terms of self-medicating behavior, if addiction isn't a word that we can always use in this setting. Um, you talked about, you know, the really obvious ones, drugs, alcohol, food. But I know that in your writing and your work, you've talked about a lot of other places that we do those sorts of self-medicating behavior that might not be obvious to folks. So what are other some of those other ways that we would be making choices that are harmful to us? What are some of the examples? Right. So what I noticed in my work was that a lot of women were um, open to um, sharing and talking about, you know, an addiction to food. And they might not necessarily call it that. They call it emotional eating or they call it binging or whatever. Um, but as I started to work with them, I started noticing that, you know, they were even very quickly realizing, even even though I may have known it, you know, I'm let, I let them come to this point where they realize, oh, it's really not about the food. It's about old memories, past, you know, painful past memories, experiences, traumas. Um, and what was showing up again and again um, related to that was relationship addiction, um, where either they were addicted to a particular person and they were having a hard time getting over it, even though even though on a logical level they could see that this person wasn't good for them or, you know, wasn't bringing, you know, joy to their life or whatever it was, that was showing up as well as, you know, being addicted to negative thinking. And I came to that um, idea more from myself is that, you know, after many years of going through, you know, feeling really depressed and having all of these negative thoughts, I realized that, you know, on some level, I didn't want to get rid of it. And when I was challenged, it was almost like I was defending it. And then you just wake up one day and you're like, wait, why am I defending this? This is not, you know, this is not useful. This is not helpful in my life. This is not helping me move forward. So I do talk in the book about, you know, being addicted to negative thinking and it feels safe. Right. And all of these behaviors, there's some level of safety, whether it's because, again, you know, knowing that it's going to work, knowing that it's going to relieve your stress. Um, you know, sometimes people will, st you know, stop drinking or stop doing drugs, for example, and they miss it. You know, like they they miss that kind of it's almost like this friend that's been with them for so long. And now there's this void, you know, and there's a grieving of that. Um so, so there is a certain level of safety. Um, again, of course, there's there's gambling and there's shopping. There's anything where anything where you know a person is feeling a high level of stress, um, and sometimes it's even a lower level of stress. It just becomes a habit, um, and they they are immediately like, oh, I need to go and you know I need to go and shop, or I need to go and spend money, I need to go to the casino, you know, just anything to escape that, to not sit with it and really process it. Um, so yeah, so I can I can see how. Um, drinking drugs and food can be functional because it's changing my biochemistry. Um, I can see how gambling and shopping could be functional because, again, there's this adrenaline rush of capture, of risk, of all of that. 
what is, and we're not saying it's good, but what is the functional reason for being in a bad relationship? What's the thing that is serving them in a short-term way, the way that the drugs, the alcohol, the shopping, the that does? So when they studied attachment theory, what they found with babies was that what they did was they brought them in a room and had their mothers leave the room. The babies who had um, anxious attachment were very like clingy and very, you know, very upset. And then the ones who had avoidant attachment almost just, you know, kind of avoided their parent, almost like they just shut that feeling off. And when we grow up, we still have these, you know, attachment patterns. And so for some people, it's going to be almost an effort to recreate that scenario or that attachment with their parent. They're going to, on a subconscious level, of course, they're wanting to heal that um, relationship. You know, they're wanting to feel that someone really loves them. And so they, you know, they, they cling or they, um, you know, they, they give too much. They don't set boundaries. They do all of these different things, wanting to stay in a relationship, except what happens is they're actually pushing the other person away, which increases the anxiety. And then the cycle just continues. So it's, you know, wanting to be loved, you know, wanting to love and be loved, right? Give and receive, except they're doing it in an unhealthy way, almost in an effort to recreate those old patterns. So I guess, and I guess there's one other type of these sorts of behaviors, um, and, and that's a newer one. We now find ourselves in a way where we can have a similar relationship with technology. What does, what does a self-medicating behavior look like in a technology sense, or what's something we should be looking out for? Yes, this one is so common now, right? Like everyone has their phone on them all the time. Whereas, you know, for myself growing up, I didn't have a cell phone until I was probably 18, 19. Um, And now we have it all the time. And it's like, you know, we're waiting in line. Oh, I have to look at my phone. We're waiting for our food at a restaurant. I have to look at my phone. And it's like, we're, we're missing out on being present. We're missing out on the relationships with the people that are right in front of us. And so what's you know, the consequence of that is that we have, you know, hundreds of Facebook friends, for example, where we have very few, you know, intimate, close relationships in person. Um, and, you know, we further isolate ourselves and then we think we're connected because we're chatting. We have WhatsApp and we have Facebook and we have all these different things, but we're not connecting with people. You know, we still need physical touch. We still need to, you know, read verbal and nonverbal cues from, you know, a real live human being in front of us. And, you know, you what they're what they're finding now is like especially especially for men you know with video games for example what they're finding is that there's this whole generation of older men that are in their 30s and 40s still living with their parents and it's depicted as you know this you know older man who years ago you know would have been married and has a family and all of that and now he's living in his parents basement you know playing video games and it's you know it's it's isolating and it's damaging and You know, in some ways, you know, I read a study that was showing that for teenagers, for example, yes, there's less, you know, teenage pregnancy has gone down, teenage drug use has gone down, but isolation, depression and anxiety have gone up with the new technology and just being connected to that all the time rather than connecting to other human beings. And so I think, you know, that's something that we do need to look at more. And and one of the things I've always been struck with when they've done addiction um, studies in the past, and they've looked at animals who've become addicted, like they push a button, they get a pebble, they push a button, they get a drug, whatever it is, mm-hmm. is that they are more likely to become addicted to it if they don't get the reward every single time, because there's the possibility it might be there and it might not be there, and they want that thing. And the way that we engage with technology is... Every single time I refresh Facebook, there isn't always a notification, but there might be one. And so it puts us in this place. And game designers know this specifically, that when games are being architect now, they're doing it in such a way that they want them to have a sticky, addictive nature because they want you using the game without thinking in terms of the greater consequence and how it impacts us in the long term. Right, right. And there's the thrill of that, right? And that's why you have people who will sit there for hours at a a slot machine right you know because it's like well it might hit and there's that thrill and there's that excitement and and there's nothing wrong with wanting excitement except if it's like again if it's affecting other areas of your life where you're missing work where you're missing you know your kids you know recitals or whatever it is you know then you have to look at it and go okay like, you know i'm taking this too far or you know what is it that's driving me to do this and what behaviors could i replace this with you know what are some other things i can do and some other studies you know have shown too that 
when, you know, especially I, I know there's a famous city called Rat Park where they have a bunch of different rats and, you know, they're they're giving them drugs. But then when they and, and they're very isolated, but when they're in a group and they're in a community of other animals and, you know, they're all connecting or whatever, they are much less likely to turn to the drugs, even though that when they were alone, they would just go back to it again and again. But when they had actual connection, there was less need, you know, to turn to those behaviors. So if we're in a situation where, if we're in a situation where we recognize the fact that this is something that might be an issue in our life, that we, that there's something that is a pattern of some sort where we're doing some sort of emotional modifying behavior, how then do we start to do work to transform this and heal this and start moving forward? Like what's the entry point? Um, you know, I think that what you'll find with a lot of people who are struggling with something like that, first of all, is, is awareness. Because for some people, you know, they've been doing it for so long. For example, checking our phone all the time. So many people are doing it that it's hard to recognize it as a behavior that might be, you know, detrimental. So being aware, and I think that, you know, I think it is okay to tell someone, hey, like, I think that you're, you know, you know, doing this too much or, you know, this might be affecting you negatively. But what I find is that with clients who are struggling with that, they really need to come to it to, to themselves, you know, by themselves. Um, and that's not always easy, but when they do, you know, allowing them to just tell their story. So, you know, one of the things that I, that I do with clients, because, you know, a lot of times they're coming in and they have this, you know, long story that they've told, you know, dozens of addictions counselors, for example, you know, and they're tired of telling their story. And so I just ask them, okay, you know, what is it that you want to let go of? You know, just so that we can summarize it, we can break it down and not have to go through their entire story. What is it that you want to let go of and what is it that you want to bring in instead? And so that's where I always start. Um, and for most clients, that's, you know, it might not be the easiest question, but it's not a super difficult question, as well, you know, either. So they'll say, you know, I, I, I want to let go of feeling the need to smoke every time I, you know, I'm on break. Or I want to let go of, you know, going to the fridge every time I walk by the kitchen. Okay. And then what do you want to bring in instead? And and this question is amazing because a lot of times we know what we don't want. We know what's bothering us in our life, but we don't really focus on what will pull us forward, you know, the vision for our life. And so I like to uh, have that question right in the beginning. And then, you know, again, with the whole thought, feeling, behavior, what is it that's bothering you about this? What is the worst part? I'll ask them. If that's the thing that's standing out most for them, like, let's get to that first. And, you know, and then we just start the tapping and, and a lot of times what I'll do is I'll have someone look at the timeline of their life, you know, so if they have a physical sensation, for example, I'll say, okay, well, let's go, let's float over the timeline of your life. And I want you to just drop into a time in your life where you felt the same feeling or where you thought the same thought, um, or when did this start? You know, there's a bunch of different questions that practitioners can use. Um, to help navigate and to help a person get to, you know, kind of the root of it. Um, and from there, you know, we can work on cravings, we can work on traumatic memories and just loosen that grip. And addiction is one that is more challenging because it is a repetitive behavior and um, it isn't just like a one-time trauma, for example. But once you start to, you know, knock down the legs of the table, as we say, then the table can collapse. And I think there are a couple of things that's really important inside of that. This idea of one, it's not a one-time trauma. The other is trying to find our way to the, the thoughts and the feelings that precede the action. Both of those things point to, at least in my mind, that these are issues that are best worked with with a professional, that there are a number of things that we can go tap on our own. But this is something that we are so close to and is woven together in such a tight way, it's really difficult for an individual tapping on their own to find their way in. Right. And I think too, you know, I, I, I have this expression that I, I heard, you know, many years ago and I really loved it because, uh, you know, there were times where I would beat myself up that I'm a practitioner, like I should be able to see this or I should know this. But, you know, even if you have like the best hairstylist, you know, when she goes to do her own hair, she can do a lot with the front. She can do the sides. She needs a little help in the back, though. You know, like everybody has spots that they can't reach or that they can't see. And so it's nice to have someone else who can, 
who could do that for you. And yeah, you're right. You know, you can do some work on your own. You can reduce cravings, for example, in the moment, um, or you can, you know, work on some stresses on your own. But when it comes to the deeper work, I definitely recommend working with a practitioner who can help you navigate. And, you know, I work with my own practitioner as well for the same reason. There's some, you know, places I can't see. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for having me. I hope you enjoyed that interview as much as I did. I'm just thrilled to be able to share that with you. If you'd like more information on Manal, all you need to do is go to tappingqnapodcast.com. Click on the link for episode 286. Um, if you happen to be listening to this again in a smartphone device, just scroll into the show notes and you'll have all of her information. We also, on the archive page and in the show notes, have the information on her new book, Food, Drugs, and Love, We Are All Addicted, just for a much broader perspective. So if this is something that you would like to work with, if you're struggling with this or you know someone who is, I would really, really encourage you to check that book out. Again, find someone in your life. Teach them how to use a podcast for International Podcast Day. Again, you don't have to send them to the Tapping Q&A podcast. Send them to something they love. If they have an interest in it, there is a podcast out there for it, I promise. There is even a podcast on writing pens, and there's a podcast on paper. If you're interested in it, you can find someone talking about it in a thoughtful, creative way. Go teach a friend how to podcast. If you have a question, a comment, something you'd like us to cover in the future, I love getting recommendations from people just like you. Drop me a note, gene, G-E-N-E, at tappingqna.com. If you're on the website, click the contact link. If you're in our app, please download our app. It's free. Um, Click on the contact button. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss an episode. You can do that in iTunes, Google Music Play, TuneIn, Stitcher, Anywhere you can find podcasts, you can find the Tapping Q&A podcast. And if you're there, leave us a rating and a review. It makes it easier for other people to find the show. For the Tapping Q&A podcast, this is Gene Montrostelli. I hope you're having a great day, and I will talk to you real soon. Bye-bye. The Tapping Q&A podcast is copyright. Gene Montrostelli, Tapping Q&A 2016. All views expressed by guests are those of the guests and not necessarily of Gene Montrostelli or Tapping Q&A.